It is your favorite movie review channel, Man Cinema Reviews, with its ever so lovely host, Peter Man. What's up, yo? Today I got a kind of lightning round movie review episode called Leftovers, the tail end releases of 2022. But before we get to those, go ahead, press like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell as well to notify you of any and all reviews to this channel. Let's go. In a lightning round fashion, the first film that we got is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Now with this film, it's the more traditional storytelling of the original source material and a um, stop motion animation that is just beautiful to look at. It is just a travesty that we didn't get to get a wide release in theaters, but you can enjoy it on Netflix as you usually do with these streaming services nowadays. But it is a great uh, imaginative stop motion animation film that adults and children alike can really get into. It's got a plethora of voice casting from the likes of Ewan McGregor, Tilda Swinton, Kate Blanchett, Christoph Waltz, the names go on and on. And it's just a great reimagining of its source material, closer to what even the live action Disney film that was just terribly reviewed and panned, even though me and my son had a grand old time with it. Um, this film is just, just better in scope and just more imaginative and more heart endearing. And it's just got a lot of great talent um, in front of and behind the camera. I really do like uh, how imaginative Guillermo del Toro sets up this world building uh, with just these pitch perfect uh, stop motion animation uh, caricatures of our beloved uh, titular character of Pinocchio. Uh, we have Sebastian J. Cricket uh, with the Jiminy Cricket uh, character. Geppetto is still a man that is obviously mourning a loss of his son and in this one it's just more apparent and that's why he carves a wooden boy and this just felt like a little bit more introspective a little bit more imaginative and just really grand in scope again this was something that i really could have gone back and you know really added it to my best ofs because i'm going to give it a full-fledged five stars it really was a great film Going on to uh, Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody. Um, I really did think that this biopic had promise. I do like, um, I believe her name's uh, Naomi Aki. Um, she is a British actress. Um, she steps in the role as the beloved Whitney Houston. Again, this is the life and times of uh, singer Whitney Houston in the 80s. Uh, a burgeoning talent that is really the voice of her generation. Um, you gotta give praise where praise due. Um, Aki really does uh, tackle it um, head on. I do like her performance, but everything else just feels like a caricature. It feels really big and surface level. Um, you know, I just really think that it's a step up from the lifetime made for uh, TV films that we've already been given. And I think that uh, without Aki's performance, you really have nothing in this very thinly veiled. Even um, Ashton Sanders, who plays Bobby Brown, I was really looking forward to him in this role. He was also RZA in the Wu-Tang Clan series on Hulu. I think he got stuck in it because he really is kind of coming off as, you know, like, baby, you know, he's got like this really gravelly voice and it's not that you know uh rambunctious playboy uh lothario that bobby brown was um and so i really do think that there's some miscasting going on stanley tucci is really a dead ringer for clive davis but other than that like i said characters and it's just a shame because this is just surface level uh, biopic and um it very mirrors uh, bohemian rhapsody 
and I just didn't want it to. I really wanted to go above and beyond. I will say that uh, scenes of her on the set of The Bodyguard, seeing that title track was really emotional, but outside of Aki's performance, there really isn't much here um, to grapple with. And so with that, I will give I Want to Dance with Somebody one and a half stars. Going on to a couple of Netflix films, uh, The Pale Blue Eye, this is Scott Cooper's latest. It's um, a investigator named Landor, played by Christian Bale, who's um, on the case of these grisly murders at West Point, the U.S. Military Academy. And uh, he uh, gets an ally, unbeknownst to him, that will be Edgar Allan Poe, a, a famous American literary figure. Uh, that will help him with his case. And like I said, Scott Cooper, I enjoyed his films. He really does have this slow pace, slow burn um, approach to his films. Antlers was something that I marginally liked. Um, I did like Hostiles. He reteams with Christian Bale in that. I don't know if I think, think he can come back and pivot to something uh, that's really substantial because the pale blue eye really is something that could have worked like I it was a grisly murder scene but this film really is a sluggish paced um, you know, thriller uh, historical drama if you will and I just don't think Scott Cooper can escape that uh, slow pace uh, sluggish uh, approach that he does uh, have with his films. Uh, Christian Bale can do what he will and uh, Henry uh, Welling, I think his name is, uh, as Edgar Allan Poe. Um, there is a promise to that, but I think he's playing it um, too big. Uh, kind of borders on caricature as well, but there is a nice chemistry between him and Christian Bale. Um, it just seems really neat, this investigative grizzly murders uh, with Edgar Allan Poe being one of the characters in the film. But I did think of it as a mixed bag for me. Um, it has glimmers of a great film, but it just doesn't quite get there. The Pale Blue Eye gets two and a half stars. And lastly, we have uh, Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu's latest bardo um, this is about a journalist slash documentarian who's going through this existential midlife crisis in, in the background of uh, telling uh, mexican immigrant stories and relaying that um, dealing with uh, family um, issues and just his identity as a journalist and a documentarian as an artist what I like about um, Alejandro Iñárritu's deeply personal film, it's an 174 minute odyssey that feels semi-autobiographical. What I liked about um, Iñárritu's approach to this is that he's really getting back to his Mexican roots. I haven't seen this dedication to uh, Mexican values uh, being set in, uh, on film not since his directorial debut in uh, Am Amores Peros, but this film is just very vast in scope. I do like the grand issues that it, it is dealing with. It's tackling with immigration and uh, being an artist and uh, having to juggle family life with uh, business and um, being approached by the media. Uh, you're not American enough, you're not Mexican enough. It really does feel like it's coming from a personal place for Alejandro Gonzalez de Niaritu, and I really do think that this is one of his most personal films. And I gotta love it for that. I really do like uh, these directors. 2022 was filled with directors telling their stories, telling their love of the cinema, telling their love of the art form, and uh, that's exactly what Iñárritu is doing here. And I really do like that he is just uh, embracing his Mexican roots, and I, I gotta love it for that. However, I do feel that it's very bloated, again, with the 174-minute running time. 
you got to pick up the pace. I know that he wanted to approach it as a dreamlike ambiance. Um, there's just these stretches of long takes where the uh, main character is going through these um, episodes in his life, uh, losing a child, uh, dealing with uh, documentaries centering on the immigrant um, struggles, and he's just wandering through these uh, set pieces, walking in daylight and then slowly turning into nighttime. It's just really very broad and big in scope, but it just fills in these large uh, voids and gaps in, in, in its pacing. And I really do think that with a little bit more editing, it being a little bit more cohesive and tighter in, in editing, I really do think that this could have been a grand masterpiece. It is a love of cinema. It is a love of the art form. And Alejandro, I do really feel the the loving embrace of Mexico. Like Mexico is just his, you know, homeland. And he, it's like coming back to, uh, coming back home. And I really do feel like he is embracing that in this film. I just really wanted to love it more than I did. Just generally liked it. Um, like I said, it just it's pacing is just very weird in pockets. Uh, it's very experimental. It does play with the space, which I uh, usually do um, like. However, it just feels like a jumble of uh, messages being shouted and yelled at you. It just feels like it's yelling at you the entire time. There's a lot of bombast. I do like the family. Um, uh, scenes. I do like the scenes in Mexico and being in this uh, very uh, traditional, you know, Catholic Mexican, um, you know, setting. However, I just feel it does seem preachy in points as well. Like it's, you know, just yelling at you, you know, like on your soapbox and it's just with a megaphone it, blaring in Spanish and in Espanol. But you know, I just think that, hey, less shouting and, you know, let's just get it more naturally. Let, let's get a better flow of it. And Bardo really does have these endearing moments, but also it's just a, a really weird mixed bag for me. But I do generally um, commend it. I do see the passion. Um, I just really wish I would have loved it more than I liked it. Um, Bardo does get a, um, a commendable three and a half, nearly four stars. I want to give it four stars, but like I said, it, it just feels a little bit bloated. Um, that is it for my leftovers episode. I uh, hope you stay tuned to 2023. I got brand new episodes coming at you very soon.